and welcome to Public Health Live, the third Thursday breakfast broadcast. I'm Rachel Breidster, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I would like to ask that you please fill out your online evaluation at the close of the webcast. Continuing education credits are available after you take our short post-test, and your feedback is helpful in planning future programs. We encourage you to let us know what topics are of interest to you and how we can best serve your needs. As for today's program, we will be taking your questions throughout the hour by phone. Our toll-free number is 1-800-452-0662, or you may send written questions by email. Please email us at any time throughout the hour at phlive.ny at gmail.com. Today's program is Bridging Gaps, the Vital Role of Cultural Competence in Healthcare. On today's program, we will address the benefits of culturally and linguistically appropriate health services, methods for providing those services, and why providing culturally competent care is essential to improving overall individual and population-based health outcomes. Our guests are Wilma Alvarado Little, a language access advocate, and James O'Barr, the Migrant Health, Co health Coordinator for the Northeast Region at Hudson River Healthcare Incorporated. Thank you both very much for being here. Thank you for Glad having us. Here. Great. So we've got a pretty big topic in front of us today, cultural and linguistic diversity, um, appropriateness of health care. So James, can you start us off just by talking about some of the key concepts that we're referring to when we talk about culture? Well, you're right. This is a very big topic. We could probably spend a couple of hours just sure. talking about culture. Um, Culture is actually a, a, a very old word originally, and it's appropriate uh, because I deal with farm workers. It originally talked about plants mm -hmm. and how we help plants grow. Um, but in, in our time, that, that definition has changed and become really expanded and continues to expand. Uh, but it refers to the... Um, uh, the, the, the language, the customs, the, um, uh, the learned behaviors that define a particular group of people or um, uh, it, can, it can define an organization, people in an organization and how they behave. But these are learned behaviors. They are not handed down from on high. Uh, and there are many, many, many cultures. And this is where public health uh, has to uh, bridge a gap because especially in this country mm -hmm. where we're a melting pot of cultures, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, the public health is intended to create a healthy environment for everyone, not just one group of people, not just certain persons, but everyone. That's the mission of public health. And just to clarify, when we say culture, I think a lot of people kind of limit their focus to racial and ethnic perceptions, but you're referring to other groups as well, aren't Absolutely. you? Absolutely, yeah, and, and that's why I said it continues to expand. We might have meant that 20, 30, 40 years ago, ethnic and uh, 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 ethnic diversity, but, um, but now we're talking about people, for example, who have HIV AIDS. Sure. Um, they have their own culture. Mm -hmm. Deaf people mm -hmm. have their own culture, people who use uh, uh, sign language, um, LGBT uh, folks, they have their own culture, and any organization has its own culture, its own individual culture. So talk to me about how these individual cultures are related to health. Um, well, because each culture has its own language, its own meanings, uh, its, uh, its own understandings, um, in order to provide health care, we have to at least have a sensitivity to the fact that what we mean and think as health care providers uh, may, not, uh, may not be the same thing. We might use words, for example, that uh, people understand differently. Mm -hmm. And certainly if people speak another language, and I think Wilma's going to give an example of that, uh, just uh, uh, how d the different meanings can uh, alter what it is we're able to do. So having at least, again, w cultural competence, I think, is not exactly the right word. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's very difficult to be competent in one's own culture. But uh, to be sensitive to sure. uh, and aware of the fact that there are other cultures and they are not less than ours. Um, we are not superior, they are not inferior, but they're different. different. 
That's sure. all. So coming from that perspective and understanding we address different cultures and trying to build more of a sensitivity to how people communicate, mm -hmm. um, certainly we can see that in healthcare this becomes a really important issue. So can you talk to us, Wilma, about culturally and linguistically appropriate services which are also known as the CLAS standards? Sure, sure. Um, the CLAS standards are um, defined as services that are respectful uh, and responsive to individual cultural health beliefs and practices. And as James had said, when we talk about culture, we're not limiting it to race, ethnicity, and language. And also, as uh, James mentioned, you know, you don't have, uh, a, a, the organization has its culture, but there's also cultures within the organizations. Mm -hmm. And especially in healthcare, drawing from the experience of being being hospital based, you can you can see that, you know, maybe um, the physical therapists uh, uh, have their culture within the organization, the social workers have their culture within the organization. And so how do we provide services and resources within the organization so that there is not a disconnect? And so this is something that the class standards help Help to define, you know, areas and and services so that they are respectful and also taking into consideration preferred languages mm -hmm. as opposed to primary language. Uh, and one of the questions that I ask when I work with clients or patients is, in what language do you get sick? In what language do you access your emotions? You know, these are questions that resonate with the individual and with the communities. And so these are some of the things that you know are helpful with the class standard so that these can be employed by all members of the organization, you know, regardless of the size and at every point of contact. Now, can you provide some background on the CLAS standards and how you were involved with that? Oh, sure. Um, it was a very, very um, exciting process. The national CLAS standards were originally developed uh, by the uh, Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health in 2000. And so then, after 10 years, you want to know what's going on. Right, and so um, so the in 2010 the Office of Minority Health they launched an initiative to update the standards and that incorporated public comment, literature review, and then ongoing consultation with an advisory committee, and that was made up the made up of 36 ex experts that represented you know various professions and disciplines. And so in 2013 we were very excited to release the enhanced class standards at the White House. And so the, now there are 15 standards. Each is an action step that organizations and professions can use in their implementation of culturally and linguistically appropriate services. That is very exciting. Um, now, what is the purpose of the CLAS standards? Why, why did these come about? Oh, well, the purpose of the CLAS standards, they're intended to advance health equity, um, help eliminate uh, health disparities, and also improve the uh, quality of services. Um, before, there really wasn't a lot of information as to how to uh, go about this. So HHS, Office of Minority Health, was able to provide guidance in this way. And so they establish a blueprint for health and healthcare organizations to implement and provide culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Excellent. Now that we've talked about sort of the background of CLAS and where it came mm -hmm. from, let's revisit why culturally and linguistically, linguistically appropriate services are important for individuals and community health. Um, one of the reasons, and there's so, so much to this, and as James said, we could talk about this sure. like, like a lot, right? <laughs> um, but, um, you know, there have been rapid changes in demographic trends in the U.S. in the last decade. You know, in 2011, for the first time, the majority of the babies born in the U.S. were members of racial and ethnic minority groups. So now we're talking about the majority minority, mm -hmm. right? So I, th I believe research indicates that by 2050, you know, this, this will be the situation. And so the nation is projected to grow increasingly diverse. And so to be able to get in front of these issues will be so much uh, of a benefit not only to the individuals but organizations so that they have the tools and the resources available to provide the best quality of care to those whom they serve. And that's why one, that's one of the reasons why this is, this is really important. And do you feel that the importance of culturally and linguistic 
Equally Appropriate Services has changed health care delivery and policy? Yes, um, the national health care policies and legislation, such as the Affordable Care Act, they've also helped to redefine and underscore the importance of culturally and linguistically appropriate services. And so there are some states, uh, such as uh, Washington, California, mm -hmm. New Jersey, Connecticut, and Oregon, they've, or Oregon, they've all passed legislation regarding educating the health care providers on cultural competency, which is a, a, a really a wonderful tool for our up and coming providers mm -hmm. so that, again, they have this information before, as I say, before they hit a unit, sure. right? Because there's so much learning going on in their own profession to have these resources is really helpful. Now, the Joint Commission has also done an amazing amount of work as well. They've set up several standards that support the provision of culturally and linguistically appropriate services. And so they've developed, you know, uh, work such as advancing effective communication, a roadmap for hospitals that guide hospitals through, you know, the, the journey of providing cultural and linguistically appropriate services because, you know, providing cultural competency isn't, you know, oh, let me check off this box, boof, poof, we're done, you know, we've done our competencies. Uh, but more so, it's a journey, it's evolving, you, we're always looking at it, our demographics change within our communities, and these source resources help keep us ahead of, uh, at, ahead of the issues. Also, to the Liaison Committee on uh, Medical Education, uh, the uh, Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education have folks that have, have done these, these pieces as well. So lots of work is being oh, done. Yes. Now, how do these services translate to different health outcomes? Um, one of the health outcomes uh, also is involving costs. So say, for example, if there's a patient who, um, or a client, for example, who is unable to be able to communicate information in a way that's appropriate, something as basic as being NPO, you know, before a procedure, if that information isn't communicated in a way that an individual does not understand, and we're talking maybe health literacy as well. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, our healthcare system is complicated English to English. Mm -hmm. So now let's add a cultural and linguistic layer to it, right? So there's, you know, there, there is, you know, the decrease of medical errors if that information is communicated in a way that is culturally and linguistically appropriate. And again, I, I don't want it to limit it to, you know, race, ethnicity, and language. Um, and then so being ahead of those medical errors as well. You know, in addition, poor communication and a lack of cultural and linguistic competence can lead to higher rates of readmission mm -hmm. and increased lengths of stays. So, you know, in these fragile financial times, this is really um, important to address. Absolutely. Both from the, not only from the patient side, but from the provider side mm -hmm. as well. Now, can this also impact how a healthcare organization does its work? <clears throat> yes, uh, adopting the framework and the implementation offers an organization the opportunity to improve the communication and helps ensure that the services are going to be met. So we're looking at quality of care. We're doing, you know, we'll be able to provide better patient uh, adherence and utilization of preventive services, right? Especially now that we have the ACA. You know, and then we have effective patient provider communication and that impacts the patient outcomes as well. So we're able to measure patient satisfaction in a way that, you know, will provide the data and the information that will be helpful to organizations, to providers, and also the patients themselves. And then, for example, um, it will also provide an opportunity for patients and clients to feel much more comfortable mm -hmm. in expressing their concerns mm -hmm. and knowing that they have the, the, the ability to be empowered to express their needs in a way that's appropriate. Now, I think you've, you've made a pretty solid case, both of you, that we've got this increasingly diverse population and a, a one-size-fits-all approach is not going to adequately meet the needs of, of the client population or the patient population. So how will the class standards help to reduce discrimination and to improve overall healthcare quality and access? Um, the, the class standards, um, provides information to be able, as I said earlier, to get ahead of some of the issues. Um, one of the things that will help regarding the discrimination is that one of my favorite quotes is by Anais Nin that says, we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. Mm -hmm. And so the class standards will help us Provide, by providing that guidance to see things through the lenses of others. So for example, if we look at it from a, from a, a, a 
geographical, cultural perspective. In some countries and in some areas, depending on the, you know, the, the socioeconomic levels and different um, uh, uh, factors, you know, issues of keeping an appointment mm -hmm. can be problematic. So if we're looking at the needs of somebody who is, for example, in an area where transportation is an issue, you know, are we going to keep that in mind when we have a provider that schedules an appointment? Mm -hmm. Are there childcare issues for an individual who has to balance, you know, childcare versus keeping an appointment, not only for him or herself, but also for their child? Mm -hmm. um, how do we go ahead and we schedule things so that it is uh, in a way that will optimize access to care for different individuals and groups. And sometimes not understanding why somebody is facing a barrier mm -hmm. can lead to that discrimination. So hopefully, you know, by utilizing some of the resources, this can open the, uh, the, the conversation. Excellent, thank you so much for sharing all of that information. Now we recently spoke with Dina Arroyo, who, di who directs the New York State Spanish AIDS, or CEDA, hotline at Centro Civico in Amsterdam, New York, about why they have a Spanish language AIDS hotline. Um, hi, my name is Dina Arroyo. I work for Centro Civico, and I'm the program director of the New York State Spanish AIDS hotline. The CEDA hotline has been here in Centro Civico since 1988. That's close to 26 years, and it's been funded by the ACE Institute. It's very unique because it's the only Spanish AIDS hotline in the state of New York. There is a huge need in the state of New York because of the barriers of the language. There's a lot of people that doesn't speak English, and all the information is mostly in English. So the hotline breaks these barriers and allow the people to know the information, updated information about HIV, AIDS, and the different STDs. The SIDA hotline deals with diversity with training because there are so many people that come from different countries and we have to be ready for that because not every person explains everything the same way. So we receive a very intensive training to be able to deal with that. We have operators from Puerto Rico, from Santo Domingo, Costa Ricans. So we can serve the whole diversity of the people who call the hotline. So they're, they're great. Uh, and people usually call, always call back to give them feedback. If they're positive, if, they're, they're, if they came out negative, they just call us back to let us know. So that's good, they, they, they make like a connection. The hotline is supposed to be for New York, but since we're working very close now with Facebook and Instagram and all that, we're receiving calls from all over the nation. So please don't hesitate, call us, because we're really here to help you get the services that you need because there's a lot of people out there that doesn't know how to get service. They don't know how to get here and get, how to get there. So we are a very important tool for the community right now because for what we know and the evaluations that we get, there's a lot of people getting a lot of care, getting support, and getting what they need just because they're calling the hotline. So I would like to let everybody know that if they got any questions related to HIV, AIDS, hepatitis C, anything related to HIV, that they can call us Monday through Friday from 8 in the morning to 5 p.m. The hotline number is 1-800-233-7432. So now that we have an opportunity to see the implementation of some of these services in the field, Wilma, can you talk about specific guidelines for implementing the standards? Sure. Um, the National Class Standards, they're comprised of the 15 standards. And then what they're, it's, they're intended to be used together. So then if they're being used together, then they're mutually reinforced. So as you'll go ahead and see on one of the slides, there's the principal standard. And that serves as a foundation for all the other standards. And then the standards are uh, broken up into three themes, the governance, leadership, and workforce, communication and language assistance, and then the engagement, continuous improvement, and accountability. Okay. Well, thank you so much for framing how the standards are, are organized. Now, James, let's turn to you for a minute and hear about how has the Peakscale Area Health Center led the way towards 
ensuring that you're providing culturally competent and culturally and linguistically appropriate services to your patient base? Well, it's, it, it's quite a story, and, um, I, but I, as we were talking about culture, I was thinking it, in, in a certain sense, comes out of the 1960s, which was a big cultural change in this country. We had the Vietnam War, of course. We had the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, we had the War on Poverty. And we had the establishment of community health centers, federally qualified community health centers in the mid-1960s. In the early 1970s in Peekskill, New York, Despite all of that change, and particularly the changes of the civil rights movement and the war on poverty, uh, the black community in Peekskill still did not have easily accessible and affordable and culturally competent health care. That is to say, black culture did not, was, was not seen as, as good as white culture at that time. And um, uh, so s some neighbors, uh, specifically led by four black women in Peekskill, uh, got uh, together and started organizing. And they, they had grown tired. They were all mothers. They had grown tired of uh, taking their kids by bus because they didn't have cars to travel with. Um, and they took their kids to the county hospital, Westchester County mm -hmm. Hospital or Medical Center. And um, they had to drag their kids 20 miles by buses, and um, then spend time in clinics waiting, spend time waiting for lab work, go and going and getting uh, prescriptions filled, taking the bus home. It was a it was a long day, uh, dragging their children around, and they got really tired of it. So they started organizing. They eventually were able to organize not only black neighbors but white neighbors. And, and eventually got a federal grant for um, a, a, a health center. And um, uh, the health center opened in 1975 with 12 employees. It was called the Peekskill Area Health Center. Um, now, federally qualified health centers, community health centers, are required to have a board. Uh, and on that board, 51% of the members are uh, required to be users of the um, health center. So uh, uh, the, uh, th that was the case at the Peekskill Area Health Center. And because they had begun mm -hmm. from a position of um, a cultural awareness mm -hmm. and sensitivity because of the way they were treated, mm -hmm. Um, that really was part of the DNA of the uh, uh, Peekskill area, area Health Center from the very beginning. So I think part of the point you're making is that it's important for an agency to have an awareness of or a sensitivity to the different diverse cultures and needs of individual populations as part of its mission for the organization. What makes this sustainable for agencies? Um, well, in the case of the health center, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the Peekskill Area Health Center, during the 1980s, we began to see um, uh, a large number of, uh, of immigrants coming into Peekskill. And um, uh, the, there were people coming in from uh, Latin American countries and Central American countries, uh, Colombia, Ecuador in particular, um, Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Um, the Caribbean, and um, uh, the the health center realized that up up to that time, it had been mostly black and white members of the community who were being seen. But uh, as the numbers of people uh, from other cultures, other countries, other linguistic groups mm -hmm. uh, began to come in, um, it was uh, realized that um, uh, there was more to be done. And in um, uh, 1989, the health center um, uh, was awarded migrant health funding. Um, and uh, at that point, the health center was going beyond Peekskill and was in five counties of the Hudson Valley. Um, 
and was required to serve farm workers who were, came from um, Maine, from Jamaica, from Honduras. Did I say Maine? Uh, <laughs> I'm in Mexico. Uh, uh, Honduras. We still had African Americans coming up from the South, another culture entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had um, uh, farm workers, uh, Mexican American farm workers coming from the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. And I think it was really at that point when the, we became migrant health providers that we decided we needed to, to do something about our corporate culture uh, to ensure that, um, that we had cultural sensitivity operating at every level and in everything that we did. So what are some of the ways that you specifically worked to build those culturally and linguistically appropriate services with the communities? Well, again, coming back to the migrant health mm -hmm. program, um, mi migrant health goes back to uh, the early 1960s. Um, uh, it was another big cultural change because it was the Migrant Health Act that eventually led to the establishment of community health centers. But um, the, the Migrant Health Law was signed into law in 1962. Uh, and from the get-go, it was understood that in order to reach farm workers, you had to go to them. You could sure. not wait for them to come to you. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So people were, uh, at the very beginning, doing outreach. And it was understood that since uh, in uh, not everywhere in the country, because a lot of farm work was, be was being done by black uh, African Americans, mm -hmm. Um, but th there were still large numbers of Mex Mexicans coming up from uh, Mexico. And yeah, I, I guess that, and also Puerto Ricans. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, from the very beginning, Migrant Health had a cultural component to it. Uh, people spoke Spanish. Uh, a lot of the providers spoke Spanish. And, uh, and they were doing outreach. They were going into the culture, into the camps of the, of the workers. Mm -hmm. um, so that was there from the very beginning. And I think becoming a migrant health provider uh, uh, really, uh, it, it, car it carried over the migrant health program's cultural competency, assumed cultural com competency from the very beginning, it was required. Uh, it carried over into the health center and its larger corporate culture. Great. So it certainly seems like the Hudson River Health Center or healthcare structure really changed to meet the needs of the population. Um, now, Wilma, can you talk about the additional components of the CLAS standards? Because it seems like you know the Hudson River Health Center was already meeting some mm -hmm. of those needs of the cultural and linguistic appropriateness based on the population changes that you saw. What are some of the additional components of CLAS that we need to talk about? Well, you know, as we saw with the work that Centro Civico is doing and then with HRHC, you know, they were already um, doing things, as you said, that are, are meeting the needs of the communities they serve. Mm -hmm. So the first theme, that's focused on government's leadership and workforce. And that emphasizes that, you know, implementing class is the responsibility of the entire organization. And so as we've seen with both of these organizations, you know, it wasn't something that was a top-down or a bottom-up approach. It was bi-directional and that really ad helps address the needs of the communities and also identify what those needs of the community are in addition to providing the workforce with the resources that they need in order to do the job that they really want to do to, to serve the, the communities. So this you know helps address situations that would be potential areas of disconnects between policy and practice. So the standards teach us that implementing the class standards at every point of contact mm -hmm. is really a critical way of meeting the needs of the community. And so when we're talking about uh, cultural relevance, cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, and also linguistic sensitivity, um, you know, these are pieces that, that the class standards can help with. And then so, uh, standard number two, that helps underscore a lot of things that um, that these organizations have already gone ahead and addressed. So, you know, this is one of the things that's so helpful when you're implementing the class standards. You know your community, mm -hmm. you've identified some of the challenges, and then, you know, leadership and the workforce uh, discusses, well, what do we do? And how can we do it well? And how can we do something that's going to make sense? 
and so is there work that needs to be done to educate, you know, within organizations, how do you get organizations to really buy in and, and decide that it's worth their while to start implementing the CLAS standards? Um, well, what, some of the things that happens is, you know, looking back at standard three, does your workforce reflect the community that you're serving or also the individuals that are uh, going to be uh, uh, living within your community? Is there an awareness of that? So how do we go ahead and educate and train our workforce? And that's one of the things that the CLAS standards helps with, you know, to identify how can you go ahead and educate Educate. How can you go ahead and train? Because if you're going to train, what are you going to train on mm -hmm. if you haven't educated folks on what you need to do? So, you know, these are some of the things that we're looking at again, you know. So you're looking at the diversity of the professionals, mm -hmm. as we talked about earlier, and this is something that Centro Civico and James has discussed, you know, that that, that was a big part of the success that they have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Wilma. Now we'll see some examples of how a New York State agency, Centro Civico, incorporates cultural confidence principles into their programs and services. Hi, my name is Fabrizia Rodriguez. I am the Director of Community Development Initiative Program with Centro Civico. Uh, Centro Civico um, was incorporated in 1988, um, and our goal and mission predominantly is to help people become self-sufficient. So we try to be the vehicle um, to mobilize that. Um, we serve, we're in a Latino organization, but we serve all cultures and try to generate unique services. Um, it's very important to understand cultural diversity. Um, specifically, I would point here to Montgomery and Fulton County because in the past decade, um, this community has been so diverse. We have every culture um, from Indian, Asian, African American, and different types of Latino. Um, cultures have all migrated here from different parts of the state. Um, additionally, we have different genders, different ages, um, different social economic groups. So we have a lot. Montgomery County in the past decade has become one of the most diverse counties you'll find uh, between Albany and Utica, New York. The CBI program has various components to it. Um, one is mobilization, and that's the biggest one. We are a grant-funded program by the Department of Health AIDS Institute that focuses primarily on mobilizing the Montgomery and Fulton County communities on educating them on HIV issues, but also keeping them mobilized on being, doing prevention work and working together. The other component of the CDI program is advocacy. So we participate in state lobbying and we also participate in local lobbying where we try to keep everybody informed locally about what the issues are um, with legislation with HIV. We'll have um, statewide or citywide events such as a health fair, um, we'll do HIV testing day. So we kind of coordinate all that but have everyone else in the community participate to actually be the ones who actively do the work. And then lastly we do community assessments. Every contract period, our contract period is five years. Um, within that contract period we're required to do at least one community assessment to address, to see what the needs are in the community. The CDI department uh, to work on community integration, we collaborate as much as possible and again it goes back to the mobilization where we host these events and coordinate these events but we rely on the community to participate um, and by doing that we're integrating each different group for instance uh, we work with the ARC out here so we're getting a, a different group from that we work with the seniors um, office of aging and that brings in a different population we work with the school districts so we're getting the students and then we work with the other local nonprofits, uh, prevention groups, Catholic charities, et cetera, and, and each one has a unique consumers that come and, and together, as, you know, working together with the, whatever event we're hosting, it becomes a community integration project. Language is important. Uh, we're one of the very few organizations that have bilingual staff, and that's become a biggest hurdle for our Latino population because, for instance, they'll have issues with housing, let's say, um, and they don't know who to go talk to, but they know if they come to Central Civico and meet Fabrizia, they can talk about HIV resources. So they'll come here and ask those types of questions. Uh, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., we have walk-in hours here at Central Civico, and any consumer can walk in and get assistance, especially with translation. So uh, that's our number one key. We'll have someone come in, and when we sit down and they came in for help with, for instance, I just had someone who came in help with the daycare funds. They didn't understand why their daycare funds was taken away. So it's important that I knew um, how to help them. 
even though my focus is on HIV AIDS, they came in with different issues um, that I at the time had to deal with. So, And it's important for the consumer because they don't have anywhere else to go. I had to be the middle person to call down to the Department of Social Services and clear it out for them. Okay. Being culturally competent is a big piece to servicing all the needs of the consumers that we have that come in. Um, specifically, for instance, I'll give you an example with diet. Um, if you don't know culturally what the consumer you know eats on a daily basis you wouldn't understand why it's so hard for them to, for example to lower the cholesterol let's say if I had a consumer who was American Caucasian I also have to be sensitive to what their needs are and understand that they have a different diet than what I grew up but I also have to be mindful of why it's challenging for them or not even just their cultural upbringing but um, for instance their economics standards um, if they're low income. So those are little things here and there that's very important because you can give as much advice as you want and referrals as you want. Are these goals that I'm proposing to them, are they realistic? Or should they take baby steps? You know, like what are some things that I can talk to them about? And also, is there someone that I can connect them with who can relate to them? My biggest advice for other communities who are trying to be culturally and linguistic um, aware or mindful, um, especially when doing social work, is to get out there. Whatever population you're working for, look for those um, educational seminars. But the other main thing to do is speak to other organizations that deal um, or that are bicultural in that culture that you're trying to get educated on. So building those relationships with other organizations that deal with the population you want to work with daily, they're your best resources. And you'd be surprised how much they want to help you help your consumers. So it sounds like some of what she's talking about really refers back to that principle one that you had mentioned or the, the principle standard. So can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. The, the principle standard, um, that helps frame the essential goal of all of the standards. And so by providing effective, equitable, and understandable and respectful quality of care and services, you know, it creates a safe and welcoming environment uh, for at, at every point of contact. And so that's really, really going to be appre appreciated, not only by the diversity of individuals, mm -hmm. but also our providers as well. And that also helps meet the communication needs so that individuals understand that the health care uh, services they're receiving, they can participate in that and also to be, be empowered to ask their questions, to ensure that when they speak with the provider that they um, are communicating what they're understanding. Mm -hmm. And that opens it up for the provider to do, for example, like a teach back. Sure. You know, is, is, you know, tell me a little bit about what you're understanding. So that's really good. And then, you know, it helps to eliminate the discrimination and the disparities. Excellent. Now, what are some of the other areas that agencies need to look at to effectively implement CLAS standards? Um, so some of the other things that they'll look at is also, you know, looking at theme two, right? The communication and language assistance. So we talked about theme one, which is talking about governance, leadership, and the workforce. So we go into theme two. And this, you know, these themes, they can either run parallel, mm -hmm or they can go ahead and run uh, um, consecutively, depending on what the, again, what the organization's culture is, where are they regarding you know, their strategic plans, how are they implementing things. So, so for theme two, um, the, this deals with more communi communication language assistance. So that talks about uh, meeting the patient's communication needs, whether it be uh, sign language, mm -hmm. braille, uh, interpreting, which is the oral communication, and translation, which is the written communication. Communication. And I just have to say that regarding the communication and language assistance piece, you know, when uh, these two terms, interpreting and translation, are unfortunately used interchangeably, mm -hmm. and interpreting is the oral, plain and simple, and translation is the written. And this impacts uh, the uh, a provider's request when they're asking for either an interpreter or a translator because they're asking for two different skill sets. Uh, unless, for example, if you're hospital-based, then sometimes, you know, as interpreters, we have to have both, right? So um, the what what part of the, what is part of the governance for this for um, 
uh, five, six, seven, and eight of the standards. And you know, this theme helps uh, organizations comply with Title VI, Office for Civil Rights of 1964, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, uh, and then other federal, state, and local mandates that require the provision of language access services. So for example, here in New York State, we have Governor Cuomo's Executive Order Number 26, which mandates state agencies provide uh, culturally and linguistically appropriate services. So this is one of the ways. Now, can you share with us an example of how cultural and linguistic misunderstandings influence health outcomes? Yes, unfortunately, one, there's, there's a, f a few things, but unfortunately, one of the cases is uh, a, a situation where poor communication led to tragic outcomes. So there is a case of Willie Ramirez in Florida. He was an 18-year-old Hispanic female, uh, fema uh, Hispanic male, I'm sorry. And what happened was he had told his girlfriend uh, that he was feeling intoxicado, which in this situation meant that he felt nauseous and then he fainted. So when then when she and his mother got him to the emergency room, somebody who had uh, a sense of the ability of speaking Spanish, uh, it converted that word to mean that he was, uh, it was more of a drug situation. So he was being worked up for a drug overdose instead of the primary issue, which ended up with uh, having uh, very, very serious consequences, and he has now been diagnosed as a quadriplegic. Uh, this resulted in a $71 million lawsuit uh, for that healthcare organization. Um, it was a malpractice settlement that could have been avoided had there been appropriate utilization of linguistic services. Also, Dr. Glenn Flores has done a lot of work regarding issues involving medical uh, errors in interpreting and outcomes of that. And then the National Health Law Program has a publication as well that's called The High Cost of uh, Language Barriers in Medical Malpractice, which uh, uh, again documents some of these unfortunate situations that are due to uh, linguistic misunderstanding. So I think standards five through eight really kind of help to address some of that. Absolutely. Um, but in the interest of time, let's move on and talk about what theme three is of the CLAS standards and what those areas are for agencies to focus on. Oh, absolutely. Theme three involves, um, you know, the engagement, continuous improvement, and accountability. And so with, this situ with these situations is, you know, how are the communities being engaged and how are organizations continuing to improve their services and also how can um, uh, organizations continue to evaluate. So there's, um, you know, these are some of the things that, the, that these themes will focus on the necessary adoptions, mm -hmm. implementation and maintenance of culturally and linguistically appropriate policies. So again, we're not having that disconnect between the policy and the practice and we're providing resources not only for the patients but the providers as well. And do you have an example of how an organization can be accountable in upholding the values? Yes, for example, there was a, a study that was published in the Journal of Healthcare Management, and what they described was that they had identified that within the Latino community, there was a lot of cases where moms were bringing their children in for ear infections. And so what they identified, first they identified this as a concern, and so that was a fabulous uh, example of, rela uh, of a relationship with um, the uh, leadership and workforce. What they were able to do was provide moms with uh, a toolkit that would help check for uh, um, temperatures and ear infections that basically cost $3 as opposed to spending $300 for an ER visit. Excellent, that sounds like a really good troubleshoot, you know, yeah. way to address yeah. the problem and be mm -hmm. preventive. Now, what are the specific CLADS, CLAS standards that address the third CLAS theme area? Um, so one of the things that addresses the, the last theme area is talking about how do you go ahead and you continue to improve and engage your community. And so um, one of the things that the class standards did with this piece is that it goes ahead and has information on how to be able to conduct these ongoing assessments. So when you look at the blueprint, it has the resources there. So what if you're doing something if you're doing this, how are you doing it? Is it working? Mm -hmm. So evaluation is always going to be part of this. And it's not always at the end. You know, you can have an ongoing evaluation sure. piece. And then how is this tra translating, if you will, into accountability for the organization? And is there something else that needs to be done for the community to have that, that understanding and that buy-in? 
Now, it sounds like um, from what you're saying, it's really important to have the staff buy-in. It's important to get staff trained. Now, James, can you talk specifically about how the Hudson River Healthcare ensured that your staff was both culturally and linguistically trained in appropriate care provision? Uh, sure. Probably the most important thing we did was to, a, a, as the uh, uh, populations we served became um, increasingly diverse, was to um, go to them mm -hmm. and bring uh, new board members in, new staff in, uh, and uh, members of the communities we were serving uh, were brought in as advisory and support uh, or uh, committees. Uh, for example, uh, in a couple of our health centers where we have a very heavy um, uh, Latino population, the Comité Latino is uh, uh, working both to do health promotion in their communities, uh, fundraising for the health center, to be involved with the health center. Um, so I'd say, again, that's probably the most important thing we did. And it, it's also important to say that we're not just talking about ethnic, racial, and linguistic diversity here, because we serve, pro we have programs that serve um, the homeless, mm -hmm. uh, people with HIV AIDS, um, uh, members of the uh, LGBT communities. Um, who else? Uh, I think I mentioned, uh, well, we Lots actually probably, yeah, we have m many more. And uh, um, so it's kind of diversity with a capital D. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we had a slide up uh, showing members of our uh, uh, plane tree orientation, which all, all staff receive, uh, going through um, uh, uh, the, uh, they spend two days of training um, uh, learning about the history, the mission, uh, the organizational values, gui guiding principles of mm -hmm. our organization. And of course, uh, amongst those uh, guiding principles are um, uh, cultural competence at an organizational level. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it important to expand your sites within the community? Um, to expand our sites? Uh, you mean uh, create new health centers? Where you're providing services? Yeah. Well, we, because probably in part because that's our mission to uh, reach out and mm -hmm. serve, uh, uh, that's our mission, to serve um, the underserved and uh, those who do not have access to health care. And it didn't stop at Peakville. Uh, by 1994, we had uh, five sites, and the first t two sites um, that were not in Peekskill were uh, farm worker sites. Um, and um, uh, we have continued to expand. In fact, uh, in, uh, uh, by now, we're up to 30 health centers wow. in, uh, in the Hudson Valley and Long Island. Um, but because the need is there, and uh, because that is our mission to serve those needs and because we're good at it. I mean, as I have said before, uh, from the very beginning, uh, we were at least culturally sensitive mm -hmm. and, uh, and aware, and uh, that has just grown with time. Which is fantastic. Now, can you describe specific activities that your center has implemented to respond to the different linguistic and cultural needs of your client base? Yeah, we, we have ongoing training, continual training, um, both for uh, staff mm -hmm. and uh, 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 providers specifically. Um, and uh, uh, we are uh, we created a cultural competence committee mm -hmm. in uh, in uh, 1994 to uh, uh, to continually explore ways in which um, our organization uh, improves its uh, uh, staff cultural competence and organizational cultural competence and. Um, uh, so uh, there, it's an ongoing thing. We have members of our staff who serve on this committee. We have mm -hmm. ad hoc committees which um, are constantly being created. For example, um, when Ebola became an issue, mm -hmm. we, um, we looked at the possibility that we might be 
dealing with an Ebola, uh, somebody from West Africa or mm -hmm. somebody who'd been infected. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe more recently, we, um, we have been working with the LGBT communities to, um, uh, uh, to make sure that those folks are, are comfortable when they come into the health center. The other thing we've been doing is training patients. We have workshops for patients in, um, in working with providers, communicating with providers so that they are feeling more confident. Uh, and, and, and have a more, um, more agency sure. in dealing with their uh, providers. Which is excellent. Now, where has all of this led you to as an agency today? I know you've got some statistics to share about the demographics of your population, the demographics of your board. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I'd be glad to. Um, we are, as I said at the very beginning, our, uh, our board uh, is required to have 51% uh, of its members mm -hmm. be um, uh, users of one of our health centers. Sure. And uh, currently, we, uh, we have um, about a, close to 100,000 patients, and there's 94,000 patients. And uh, so we have 20 board members. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try to keep it as close as possible to the breakdown of uh, African Americans, um, uh, uh, Hispanic Latinos, um, and uh, other um, uh, other uh, uh, racial, ethnic, or uh, other cultures. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, for example, LGBT people would be represented. Mm -hmm. um, um, homeless, maybe HIV/AIDS. Great. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's a continual process. Mm -hmm. uh, we're constantly looking at the, f the figures we get back from the cultural diversity of our patient population. Our UDS every year mm -hmm. tells us who the folks are that are coming in, mm -hmm. and we reassess, do we need more people from a different community on our board? Or do we need to create a support mm -hmm. group in uh, that community? So it sounds like from what you've said, I mean, your organization really grew out of sort of a grassroots, culturally sensitive yeah. situation, and you've really maintained that even as your organization has grown to be able to serve a much broader population. Correct. That's really terrific. Now, in doing this also, we've, it sounds like you've really taken the CLAS standards and incorporated those. I'd like to make sure that everyone watching today knows how to find out more about information about the resources that we talked about. So just if you look on your screen and also um, within your slides handouts, which are available on our website, we've got the hotline number as well as Hudson River Healthcare's number that you can find for more information about what we've discussed today. Um, so now that we know what the CLAS standards are, and we've heard a little bit about an agency that's worked mm -hmm. so hard to provide this kinds of competent staff, Wilma, where can we go to find more information about how to use these standards? Oh, um, there's a, a blueprint for advancing and sustaining the CLAS policy and practice. That's simply referred to as the blueprint, and that's the new guidance document for the CLAS standards. And that explains the enhancements, the concepts found, and, and throughout the standard. And we can you can find those at www.thinkculturalhealth.hhs.gov. Excellent. All right. Um, and is there anyone you'd like to acknowledge in today's program before we're going to take a few questions from the audience, but I know there were folks you wanted to acknowledge in your presentation. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge Dr. Nadine Gracia. She's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health and uh, the Director of the Office of Minority Health, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And also Ms. Christine Montgomery. She's the Management and Project Analyst uh, for uh, a Project Officer for Think Cultural Health, Office of Minority Health. and. Uh, Ms. Mr. Godfrey Jacobs, he's the Senior Program Manager for Health Determinants and Disparities Practice, SRA International, and his team who have done a wonderful job of guiding us through the revision of the class standards. Excellent. Thank you both so much. We have a couple of questions from the audience. I'm going to try to get through them quickly. Um, the first question was, in cases, where, in cases where patients are reporting the use of herbals in the treatment of a chronic medical condition, particularly among patients of diverse backgrounds, how would you recommend a medical provider effectively navigate through their own beliefs regarding non-traditional treatments if they conflict with that of the patients? We have this very 
Yeah. V very commonly yeah. in uh, far mm -hmm. the farm worker population mm -hmm. and in other mm -hmm. um, uh, communities that we serve mm -hmm. as well, but, but particularly with um, our farm workers. And one of the things we do is we, we get the providers, uh, the nurses mm -hmm. and the uh, physicians and nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, whoever's working with them, mm -hmm. to educate themselves about mm -hmm. um, herbal remedies, mm -hmm. the use of curanderas, which mm -hmm. still happens in our... Yeah, mm -hmm. well, the promotors, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. it's partly an education. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, y y you know, if those remedies are working and people are getting healthier, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with them as sure. long yeah. as they're not toxic. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, or so have some kind of interaction. Yeah. Right. yeah. So we honor, we, tr we try to honor that and mm -hmm. not make it look like they're getting inferior medicine or doing something wrong. That's mm -hmm. really important. Yeah. But to show an understanding. Mm -hmm. And also, too, taking it back to a, a, a step before that is creating that environment where that patient will disclose That's right. that they are also utilizing, yes. you know, this form. Because, you know, to other communities and other populations, we're alternative medicine mm -hmm. here in the States. So creating that environment where they can disclose sure. and then having the provider have an awareness of it so that he or she can do the best in the interest of, of his or her patient. Mm -hmm. So I think creating that space an would, be, would be really helpful first because you know, we can get the nod and say, uh-huh, uh -huh, yes, doctor, I'm gonna take what you tell me, and then go home and do what cultures have been doing for a long time. Absolutely. So being able to have the opportunity to have that relationship mm -hmm. and then the discussion is really helpful. Excellent. I'll see if we can squeeze in one more question. Um, as racial and ethnic minorities become the majority, why do public health policymakers still refer to these groups as minorities? This is a big question and yeah. we've only got a couple of minutes, so let's see what, what your thoughts are. Um, well, um, earlier in the presentation I had mentioned that, you know, this is what the data is showing, this mm -hmm. is what the research is showing. And so uh, as, as uh, James had, had, uh, had said uh, to me earlier, um, you said it so beautifully, this is a, a habit? It's a habit. Yeah. It's a habit, a term of art, mm -hmm. minority, majority. Yeah. But this is no longer functional. Mm -hmm. And the language has to change mm -hmm. as, we, as we change. And then we'll see how it influences policy, and then how it'll go into practice. And let's hope let's hope yeah. that it does. That as things mm -hmm. change, we we develop our policies to respond to the changing needs of our population. Right. Well, thank you both very much for starting the conversation on what's a very big topic. It was great to hear from you both today. Well, thank, thank you, you for having us. And thank you very much for joining us today. Please remember to fill out your evaluations online. Your feedback is always helpful to the development of our programs, and continuing education credits are available. To obtain nurse continuing education hours, CME, and CHES credits, learners must visit www.phlive.org and complete an evaluation and the post-test for today's offering. Additional information on upcoming webcasts and relevant public health topics can also be found on our Facebook page. Don't forget to like us on Facebook to stay up to date. This webcast will be available on demand on our website within two weeks of today's show. Please join us for our next webcast on January 15th, Pre-Diabetes, How Healthcare Providers Can Take Action. I'm Rachel Breidster. Thank you for joining us on Public Health Live. Healthcare, this becomes a really important issue. So, can you talk to us, Wilma, about culturally and linguistically appropriate services, which are also known as the CLAS standards? Sure, sure. Um, the CLAS standards are um, defined as services that are respectful uh, and responsive to individual cultural health beliefs and practices. And as James had said, when we talk about culture, we're not limiting it to race, ethnicity, and language. And also, as uh, James mentioned, you know, you don't have, uh, a, a, the organization has its culture, but there's also 
cultures within the organizations mm -hmm. and especially in healthcare drawing from the experience of being being hospital based you can you can see that you know maybe um, the physical therapists uh, uh, have their culture within the organization the social workers have their culture within the organization and so how do we provide services and resources within the organization so that there is not a disconnect and so this is something that the class standards help Help to define, you know, areas and and services so that they are respectful and also taking into consideration preferred languages mm -hmm. as opposed to primary language. Uh, and one of the questions that I ask when I work with clients or patients is, in what language do you get sick? In what language do you access your emotions? You know, these are questions that resonate with the individual and with the communities. And so these are some of the things that customs the um uh, the learned behaviors that define a particular group of people or um, uh, it, can, it can define an organization, people in an organization and how they behave. But these are learned behaviors. They are not handed down from on high. Uh, and there are many, many, many cultures. And this is where public health uh, has to uh, bridge a gap because especially in this country mm -hmm. where we're a melting pot of cultures, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, the public health is intended to m create a healthy environment for everyone, not just one group of people, not just certain persons, but everyone. That's the mission of public health. And just to clarify, when we say culture, I think a lot of people kind of limit their focus to racial and ethnic perceptions, but you're referring to other groups as well, aren't Absolutely. you? Absolutely, yeah, and, and that's why I said it continues to expand. We might have meant that 20, 30, 40 years ago, ethnic and uh, 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 ethnic diversity, but, um, but now we're talking about people, for example, who have HIV AIDS. Sure. Um, they have their own culture. Mm -hmm. Deaf people mm -hmm. have their own culture, people who use uh, uh, sign language, um, LGBT uh, folks, they have their own culture, and any organization has its own culture, its own individual culture. So talk to me about how these individual cultures are related to health. Um, well, because each culture has its own language, its own meanings, uh, its, uh, its own understandings, um, in order to provide health care, we have to at least have a sensitivity to the fact that what we mean and think as health care providers uh, may, not, uh, may not be the same thing. We might use words, for example, that uh, people understand differently. Mm -hmm. And certainly if people speak another language, and I think Wilma's going to give an example of that, uh, just uh, uh, how d the different meanings can uh, alter what it is we're able to do. So having at least, again, w cultural competence, I think, is not exactly the right word. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's very difficult to be competent in one's own culture. But uh, to be sensitive to sure. uh, and aware of the fact that there are other cultures and they are not less than ours. Um, we are not superior, they are not inferior, but they're different. different. That's sure. all. So coming from that perspective and understanding we address different cultures and trying to build more of a sensitivity to how people communicate, mm -hmm. um, certainly we can see that in Welcome to Public Health Live, the third Thursday breakfast broadcast. 
I'm Rachel Breidster, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I would like to ask that you please fill out your online evaluation at the close of the webcast. Continuing education credits are available after you take our short post-test, and your feedback is helpful in planning future programs. We encourage you to let us know what topics are of interest to you and how we can best serve your needs. As for today's program, we will be taking your questions throughout the hour by phone. Our toll-free number is 1-800-452-0662, or you may send written questions by email. Please email us at any time throughout the hour at phlive.ny at gmail.com. Today's program is Bridging Gaps, the Vital Role of Cultural Competence in Healthcare. On today's program, we will address the benefits of culturally and linguistically appropriate health services, methods for providing those services, and why providing culturally competent care is essential to improving overall individual and population-based health outcomes. Our guests are Wilma Alvarado Little, a language access advocate, and James Obar, the Migrant Health Health Coordinator for the Northeast Region at Hudson River Healthcare Incorporated. Thank you both very much for being here. Thank you for Glad having us. Here. Great. So we've got a pretty big topic in front of us today, cultural and linguistic diversity, um, appropriateness of healthcare. So James, can you start us off just by talking about some of the key concepts that we're referring to when we talk about culture? Well, you're right. This is a very big topic. We could probably spend a couple of hours just sure. talking about culture. Um, culture is actually a, a, a very old word originally, and it's appropriate uh, because I deal with farm workers. It originally talked about plants mm -hmm. and how we help plants grow. Um, but in, in our time, that, that definition has changed and become really expanded and continues to expand. Uh, but it refers to the, um, uh, the, the, the language, the 